chapter in Matthew 26, if you would. There's a little confusion, and some of you Bible scholars out there, you may know a little more than I on this. I, I've tried to research and understand, and I think I've come up with my own personal opinion on it, but I, I think it's up for debate a little bit. In Matthew 26, we see a story. In verses all the way back to chapter 21, Jesus enters Jerusalem. Now, as Jesus is in Jerusalem, excuse me, the Passion Week, he would do several things that week, and uh, he would eventually die on a cross, and uh, he would eventually be buried, and I don't know, there's a lot of discussion, did he die on Friday, did he die on Thursday, you know, a lot of good people disagree on that, and I have, once again, I have an opinion on that, but one thing we know for sure is on the first day of the week, he wasn't in the tomb. That's one thing we know beyond a shadow of a doubt. That is one thing. Now, we can discuss some of the timeline. We'll do that a little bit in the message today. Is this the same story in John chapter 12 and in Mark and Luke? Are these a little different? We might discuss that just a little bit. There's a little discrepancy, and, uh, but we can have opinions on that. But one thing we know for sure, Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again, and he's coming back. Now, do we have a conflict of interest in living for him? Okay, that's what I want to get to today. Okay, we come to Matthew 26, and Jesus has already entered Jerusalem in our story, and he's already done several things, but it would look like, it appears to me, in chapter 26 and verse 6, it almost takes us back to possibly an event that happened, I believe, the Saturday prior. This could have happened maybe on the Wednesday before crucifixion or the Saturday with timeline and things. I'm not 100% sure. So let's just dive into the story and uh, try to figure out what's going on here. So Bethany, this city he's in, is located about two miles from Jerusalem. Now it's said that Jesus would go. He would go to Jerusalem during that week uh, before the Passover. People are flooding in from all around the room to uh, all around the world. They're coming into Jerusalem, and as they're coming to Jerusalem, Jesus did a few things that week. Remember. Remember what he did? He went in and he flipped over some tables and told them, don't use my house for this. And uh, he went in and he, he dealt with things. He, he prophesied to his followers some things that were going to happen. He'll do several things that week. But at night, from what I understand, he would go back and stay. According to the book of Mark, he would go back and stay with uh, uh, Lazarus, the one who he had raised. Mary, and Martha, and Lazarus, his good friends. So he would travel approximately two miles outside of Jerusalem at night and probably go and stay with his good friends in the evenings. Now, in our story here, we find that he's in Bethany and he's at a certain person's house named Simon the leper. Now, obviously, Jesus had healed him because they wouldn't be in his house if he still had leprosy. He wouldn't even be in the city. Jesus had healed him and they're sitting down for dinner and they're having dinner. Let's just get to kind of the story, and then we'll dive in a little, a little more. Jesus is sitting here at dinner, and generally there'd be kind of a U-shaped table, probably, uh, what would happen, and people would come in and they would serve from the inside of the U-shaped table. And on the outside, they wouldn't sit like we would at a table, you know, at the table about this high, and eat like that. They would recline and lay back, uh, like, yeah, I'm not going to... Not going to model for you here or anything, but they would more recline and lay back. They're at dinner. Lazarus is there. Simon the leper's there. The disciples are there. They're being fed. They're, they're having a good time. I don't know exactly what Jesus is saying, but in the middle of all of it, a woman walks in with some very precious, something very precious to her. As a matter of fact, something that could have possibly, could have possibly been worth a year's wages. Possibly. Just by putting it all together, that's kind of what it seems. In our vernacular, someone has said when you compare their money and our money, um, probably about $40,000, some have said. Maybe a year's wage. I understand money differs, you know, right now, inflation, I don't, don't get into all that. But it, it, was a, it was very expensive is what they would say. She comes in and she breaks this open and immediately there's this beautiful, wonderful aroma that's going through. And all of a sudden, in front of everybody, she walks up to Jesus. And in this, this story that's told to us by Matthew, she dumps it on his head. It's this, it's this thick, oily, uh, nard-type stuff. It's dumped on his head. It flows down. And 
everyone around the room is appalled and very indignant that this woman interrupted their dinner. Now, I, I, you know, in a, in a funny side, I can kind of see, you know, why being a little upset, right? When I'm, when I'm eating, you, you leave the spiritual stuff for another time, right? She comes in. She does this. They're all having dinner, and everybody stops and looks at what she's done, and they are very indignant, and they would speak up. And then Jesus will respond in a certain way. And that's what I want to get to today, this conflict of interest at Easter, this conflict of interest. My priorities reveal my true devotion. If you look at my calendar, it ought to reveal that I am fully devoted to Christ. If you look at my checkbook, it ought to reveal I am fully devoted to Christ. If you look at my text messages, it ought to reveal I am fully devoted to Christ. If you look at my Facebook account, it ought to reveal I am fully devoted to Christ. If you look at Twitter, whatever it is about you, it ought to reveal you are fully devoted to Christ. My interest should align with my full devotion to Christ and his cause. I may not like everything in life, but I know God has a plan. Christ did everything for me in my sinful state. I should do everything I can for him in my redeemed state. Amen? If you're here and you're saved, that means you've been redeemed. The word justified, the word redeemed because of Christ's propitiation. We talked about that a couple Sunday nights ago. We've been redeemed. That means he's bought us back. So Jesus came in my sinful state and he redeemed me and I owe everything to him. There should never be a conflict about what comes first in my life. There should never be a, well, I would rather do this or this, oh, just you got to understand. That should never come up. It ought to automatically be everything I do. My highest priority is my devotion to my Savior. Everything else comes second. That's easier said than done. Because as you and I all know, life happens. Doesn't it? Life happens. And, and, and sometimes life can be hard. Everything in my life I do is directly or indirectly affected by my interest aligning with my devotion to his cause. Now... With all that being said, I want you to look at a couple different groups of people here. I want you to write down, if you're taking notes tonight or this morning, I want you to write down their interest was self-righteousness. Their interest was self-righteousness. Say, Pastor, what do you mean? Go back to verse 1 of chapter 26. Verse 1 of chapter 26. Okay? And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover. This is about to happen. Jesus is about to die. And the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Jesus has told them. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas. And consulted that they might take Jesus subtly and what? Kill him. But look at what they say in verse 5. I think this is very interesting. Everybody looked at verse 5. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Guess what's going to happen? Jesus is going to die on the feast day. You know, these people who thought they were in control of Jesus' death actually <laughs> were fitting in right according to the plan of God. They thought they could determine when Jesus would die, but Jesus already had a planned time, a planned date, and a planned purpose, and no one could alter that purpose. I love that. I, I, think their, uh, I think their pride is, uh, I think they're, they're inflated with their ego thinking they get to determine God's plan for humanity. Uh-uh. <laughs> That's not how it works. Sometimes you and I get our ego and we like to tell God, this is when this is going to happen. This is how it's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. And sometimes we're acting just like the high priest in Caiaphas. Now, we're not necessarily going to kill the Son of God, but we're trying to tell God what God can and can't do with my life. That's the same attitude they have. We'll determine when it happens. We'll determine how it happens. It's on us, and we'll make it work. Their interest was self-righteous. It was because they wanted what was best for them. They understood if they had, they killed a religious person during the Passover, there are so many thousands of extra people in the city at this time, there could be a religious uproar. And they didn't want that because that wouldn't look good for them. 
They didn't want that. That wouldn't be a good thing. People in Jerusalem were excited as the festival approached, and the chief priests planned to wait until after the festivities to kill Jesus. But guess what? They didn't have a say. <laughs> Jesus already knew when he would come. He already knew when he would die. Jesus was very detail-oriented. He wasn't like me and forgets things, right? <laughs> he wasn't like, you know, it's, it's, he put it on his calendar and then he forgot to look at his calendar. Anyone else? I know we were talking about that, me and Taylor, were earlier today. We we're, were in the same wavelength, right? I just called Taylor out. Him and I are both on the same wavelength. That's not Jesus. Jesus knew exactly when he would die. And no one could alter that. Jesus knew exactly when he's going to come back, and no one's going to alter that. He already knows when the last person that's going to get saved is going to get saved. He already knows that. He knows when his angels will return, he'll return, the trumpets will sound. He knows all of that. Aren't you glad we have a God that's in control? Absolute control of this universe and everything that happens here? He is in control. Man, that ought to give you comfort. That ought to give me comfort. Look here at what they think. They actually believe they're in control of Jesus' destiny and plan. Let me tell you uh, what Josephus, the great historian, says about Caiaphas years later. I find this very interesting. About two years after the Lord's crucifixion, Caiaphas and Pilate, they, were, they got in some trouble by the leadership of Rome. Then governor of Syria and afterwards emperor, Caiaphas, unable to bear this disgrace, and I believe the stings of his conscience for the murder of Christ, he would kill himself two years later. Now, I don't know all of that, why he did that. Maybe this haunted. I have no idea. But I do know this. Caiaphas, the one who thought he could tell God what to do, two years later would be found dead. Coincidence? Caiaphas played a pivotal role in putting Jesus in the cross, humanly speaking. But he was just doing, he wasn't telling Jesus what he could and couldn't do. He was acting on his self-righteousness. He was acting on what was good for him. Notice what they say, though, in verse 4. We're going to take him away. We're going to kill him subtly because he's been a nuisance to us. We don't want hear him here anymore. Carson says it this way of this, this verse. The leaders were right in fearing the people. Jerusalem's population swelled perhaps fivefold during the feast and with a religious fervor and national messianism at a high pitch, a spark might set off an explosion, so they were fearful. Now, jump to verse 6 and 7, if you would. I don't know exactly when this part took place. Was it on the Saturday? Was it on the Wednesday? Was this another event? I'm not exactly sure, but I know it happened. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, so he's here in this house of this man who had been healed. A lady comes to him in verse 7, having an alabaster box of very precious ointment. Several people have a lot to say about this box of ointment and what she would have had. Some people say it would have hung around her neck. Some people say this is what she would have given to her husband on their wedding night as an act of devotion and pledge for her husband. I don't know about all that. What I do know is this was extremely valuable and extremely important. Probably one of the most expensive things she owned in her life. The most precious thing in her life. Matthew uh, comments the perfume was costly, but in Mark's gospel, uh, specifically Judas in John's gospel, estimates this as 300 denarii. In ancient Judea, Judea, a single denarius was worth a day's wages. So 300 of them would have been almost worth a year's wages. Now, this was not commanded by God to do this. This was not required to do this. Uh, and in some cultures, they would pour oil as a, as a sign of a distinguished guest. But this was not required. Her ointment could have been uh, possibly the most important thing she had in the world. But I want you to write this down. We just saw their interest was in their self-righteousness and what was good for them. I want you to write this down. Her interest was in Christ. Very simply. Her interest was in Christ. It was not commanded. It was not required. This was something over the top because of her allegiance and because of her devotion to the Son of God. This could have been her retirement. 
This could have been sold for so much. This could have been put to personal use. They say they would get this from India or Asia. They say around Asia. They, this, this was very important to her. But you know what her interest in Christ brought with it? It brought generosity. Her interest in Christ would bring sacrifice. You know what else her interest in Christ brought? Ridicule and scorn from others. Ridicule and scorn from others. And I can just imagine, she may have been a little nervous. I don't know how it worked, but she was coming into a room. Everybody's eating. Everybody's relaxing. And they're thinking about Lazarus. And maybe someone's making a joke about Lazarus or Simon the leper. Maybe they're talking about the power. Maybe they're asking Lazarus, Lazarus, what was it like to be dead? I mean, what, man, what, what, I don't know what the conversation, maybe Jesus was teaching, everybody was looking at him. That's probably what was taking place. But this woman walks in, walks up to Jesus, opens this bottle or box or however it was, and immediately this aroma goes through the room. Very powerful smell, very wonderful smell. She dumps it on Jesus. Man, that'd be a little awkward. If somebody walked into our service right now and they came up to somebody and just started dumping oil on them, do you think that'd be a little weird and awkward? Now, in our culture, it would be a little different. Don't let me conflate the two, okay? Don't, don't, don't put those two together. But wouldn't it be a little strange? You've interrupted. But her interest was in Christ, and she didn't care about the ridicule. She didn't care about the scorn. She didn't care about any of that. All she did was want to give her best to Christ. You know what your goal and my goal should be? I want to give my best to Christ in every part of my life. I want to give him my best part of my time I want to give to Christ. I want to give him the best part of my finances I want to give to Christ. I want to give him the best part of my life I want it to count for Christ. My interest should be in Christ. Sadly, many of our interest goes from Christ back to Caiaphas, to Christ, to Caiaphas. We're acting differently. Sometimes it's in our own self-righteousness. Sometimes it's in our own personal gain instead of full devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. She comes into this room. She pours this oil upon Jesus. She anoints him. Um, I, I kind of think... Um, you know, this was even a picture of David when in Dave, uh, Psalms chapter 23 and verse 5, it talks about thou anointest my head with oil. I think there was something very significant about Father David had his head with oil and she was doing this because she understood the significance of who Jesus was. She may have not understood that he was going to die. I don't know if she fully understood all of that. Jesus said she did it for my burial, but I don't know if she fully grasped everything that was going to happen, but she knew she was going to give her best to Jesus Christ. Her interest was in Christ. Look down at verse 8 if you would. Verse 8, you still with me this morning? We're almost through. Verse 8. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. I want you to write this down. Thirdly, if you would, their interest, that's the disciples and the people around, was in man's rationality. Their interest was in man's rationality. The words here that they are using in the Greek, it means moral outrage. They were aghast that she would come in and she would waste her precious ointment on the head of Jesus. They said it's a waste. What are you doing? What are you thinking? Their interest was in man's rationality. And by the way, man's rationality and the way we, we process things, that can get us in some trouble, can it? When it's not Christ first and devotion to him first, it's what makes sense to me. It what makes sense at this time in my life instead of Christ first. Man, we've got it way out of line. We've got it way out of line. Completely aghast, the disciple says, what is this waste? Their interest was good. What did they say? We could have sold it and given it to the poor. So how does Jesus respond here? How does Jesus respond? Okay, Jesus responds. He doesn't blast them, if you will. He doesn't, you know, mock them, if you will. What he says, you know what, you guys have a good point. You should use it for the poor. You should help the poor. Jesus gave verse after verse after verse to help with charity. 
He, he, that's a big thing for Christians. We ought to be charitable. But not before we give to Christ first. Christ was here with them at this time. Jesus said, you have the poor always with you. You can always do things for the poor. Me? You're not going to have me here. What she's done, she is showing she is fully devoted to me. Nothing else matters except me. Man, what a statement. There was no conflict of interest with this woman here. There was no, man, I'm kind of half in to follow Christ, and I'm kind of half out. It just depends on what's required. I'm kind of partially into this thing. No, I'm going to give Jesus the most important thing in my life. It's going to cost me something, and it might hurt me down the line, but Jesus is worth every penny of it. Her interest was Christ. These other interests, it was in their self-righteousness. The disciples and other people around, it was in man's rationality. Caring for the poor is good, but our highest priority should be God, should be the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, you know, a lot of, I don't want to stop on this for too long, but I know too many people, we are really big into helping this charity and this charity and this charity and this charity helping the hospitals and by the way i'm okay with that but first you give to god and his work every single time i am for you helping as many charities as you want praise god for christian people who help with that i'm for it and i'm for you helping the the doggy humane society and all these i'm for all that but you make sure god comes first amen don't do what they did. We'll give to no. Do God do, give to Him first. Very quickly. Lastly, this morning, I want you to see what Jesus does here. Okay, so we see uh, their interest in Caiaphas. We see her interest was in Christ. We see their interest as followers of Jesus was in man's rationality. But what were Jesus' interest? Shouldn't this be the most important thing here today? If you've missed the whole lesson, the whole sermon, you listen to this. Jesus' interest was in recognizing and rewarding the faithful work of his followers. This is the best part of the story. It wasn't like her sacrifice went unseen. Look at what Jesus said here. Okay, in verse 10. You ready? When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon... Is everybody there? Verse 10. The end of it. What's that word? Jesus is talking, so he's talking about him. She's done a good work to me. Jesus noticed her sacrifice. Jesus noticed the ridicule and scorning a little bit, if you will, the scorn from other Christian people. And Jesus zeroed in and took notice of this woman's sacrifice to advance his cause. Say, Pastor, there was no conflict of interest with her. There was with Caiaphas. There was when we look at man's rationality. But when we put Christ first in absolutely every area, Jesus recognizes it and he rewards it. Look at what he goes on to say. Ye have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. I don't know if she fully grasped everything that was going to happen the next couple days. But what she did know, this person, Jesus, he is the Messiah. He is God. And she reverenced him in that way. And then Jesus says this, Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. Jesus said, you know, who's here? The disciples. One of them is going to betray him very soon. You know who the, who's going to take the gospel to the world? The disciples. The church will start. Eventually Paul will come. This lady's message is going to go all around the world. God recognized and God rewarded. There was no conflict of interest. I find too often... In the Christian circles, we claim to be followers of Christ, but there are other things in our lives that are just as important. 
and I can't understand it, and I can't grasp it, and it makes no sense to me why sometimes God can be put on the burner, the side burner, so I can do other things, things that we know we should do, things that God has instructed in his word to do, and then we put it aside and act like it's not a big deal. And it's shameful, and it's wicked, and it's wrong. We have a conflict of interest, and we need to be honest today and say, you know what? That is more important to me than what God said. My pleasure, my enjoyment, my fun, my ad all those things, they're more important to me than what God said. And shame on us. We are acting just like these followers. It's all based on our, you know, if we feel good, if, if God would do this for me, if God will give me this, if God will give that. Man, we need some more people like this woman here who come in and say, you know what, I'm going to give the best that I have, even though it might cost me in my retirement. Even, I don't, I, this is important to me. He comes first. And it's not the dollar amount, church. It's, it's, not the, it's not what I'm trying to get you to do. I'm not trying to take up an offering afterward for my Dunkin' Donut gift cards. That's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to get us to all see. It's the heart that came with it. She knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he should be first in her life, and it didn't matter what it cost her. One day here soon, Peter's going to remember this. John's going to remember this. James is going to remember this. All of Jesus' followers, except for one, are going to be killed for this cause. And, they're, and at one point, some point down the road, Peter's not going to have a conflict of interest anymore. He's going to stand up and say, do with me as you must. I just don't want to be crucified like Jesus. Crucify me in a different way. So they crucify him upside down. John says, I won't, I won't say this about Jesus. I'm going to serve Jesus. So they put him in a pot of boiling oil. Thomas, they say, would be, would be, the different ones would be stabbed with spears and dragged through the streets and different heartaches and troubles. One day there'll be no conflict of interest. I ask you today, it's, it's just Easter season. Jesus did die he did he was buried he did rise from the grave is there any conflict of interest in your life i hope not i prayed before i came out here today in my office and i prayed god show me some things and he did are there some things in my personal life that i would never you know i wouldn't say like yeah it's more important than god but by my actions i'm acting like that's more important than him my allegiance and my devotion ought to be to Christ with everything that I have. Friend, is that you? What group would you put yourself in? What group? Where are your interests? Where do they align? Where's your devotion? Oh, friend, there's a story, and I'll finish with this story. It's a story of a, a couple. Faith honors God, and God honors faith. For 10 years, Mr. and Mrs. Moffat labored faithfully in Botswana. Without one ray of encouragement to brighten their way, they could not report a single convert. For 10 years, no one got saved. Finally, the director of the missions board began to question the wisdom of continuing the work. The thought of leaving Botswana, however, brought great grief to this devoted couple, for they felt sure that God was in their labor and that they would see people turn to Christ in due season. So they stayed for a year or two longer. Darkness still reigned. No one got saved. Then one day, a friend in England sent word to the Moffats that she wanted to mail them a gift and ask what they would like, trusting that in time the Lord would bless their work, Miss Moffat replied, send us a communion set. I am sure that we'll have a church and we'll need it soon. God honored this dear woman's faith. The Holy Spirit moved upon the hearts of the villagers and soon a little group of six converts after 10 years was united to form the first church in that land. The communion set from England was delayed in the mail, but on the very day before the commemoration of the Lord's Supper, the set arrived. You understand, they devoted their lives for Christ. There was ridicule, there was scorn, there was suffering, there was heartache. They literally gave everything they had for Christ. And at times it felt like it's not worth it. There's nothing rewarding in this. It doesn't seem to be worth my time, my effort, my energy. And one day God blessed. Friend, you may be feeling it's not worth my time. 
It's not worth my effort. It's not worth all this struggle to put God first. I could be having more fun doing other things. Oh, friend, it is so worth it. Where do your interests lie? Do you have a conflict of interest? Heads bowed and eyes closed this morning. Heads bowed and eyes closed today. You'll be getting ready for the baptistry here in just a moment, but nobody else look around if you would. I'm going to have a couple people at the front of the auditorium, or the bride, Miss Connie. If you'd like someone to pray with or someone to talk to. Maybe you've been concerned about your salvation, and you'd like someone to talk to you about that. Hi, Miss Connie here. She'll have a Bible. Brother Brian here, he'll have a Bible. He'll be ready if you'd like to talk to someone. I want to ask you a very important question. Is there a conflict of interest in your life? Has the Holy Spirit spoken to you? I don't want to keep pushing on the message. You know. You know. God put some things in your head that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt. They're a conflict of interest. You love God. You care about Him. You want to serve Him. But there's some things that you know are holding you down. Miss Retha, if you'd just play silently throughout the auditorium. If you'd like to use an altar, it's open. You can you can come down here and pray, kneel, and talk to God. I find that very helpful for me. If you're in your pew and you'd like to pray right there in your pew, why don't you do so right now? Some will come to an altar. Is there a conflict of interest? Oh, friend, has your mind been playing tricks on you? Oh, yeah. Have you been struggling with this or that and your eyes are being taken off from the cross and off of Jesus Christ? Has there been any of that this week? Oh, friend, please. Tell God right now. Tell him there's a conflict of interest in your life. Just be honest because he already knows. Maybe you're here today. Please don't look around for a moment. I want to ask an honest question. Just between you and God. If you're here today, if Jesus did come back, do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you would go to heaven with him? Not based on what you've done, but based on what his word says. Has anyone ever showed you that? You say, Pastor Lang, I'm here today and I'm not sure about that. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? I'm looking all around the room. If I, I just want to pray. I see that hand. You put it down. I see that hand. You put it down. 